Good morning and welcome to Unity Church of San Antonio. I'm, I'm so blessed to be here this morning and look at all you beautiful lights shining out there. Um, my name is Belinda Herrera and I am your celebration host today. And so we come together as a, as a powerful vibration in the universe and we affirm why we are here. Together, as divine love, we envision a spiritually transformed, peaceful world. And as divine love, dance in the truth of who we are, meditation, study, and service. So today we have a wonderful guest speaker. She's, she's uh, been here before, so we'll, we know that she's awesome. She's awesome anyway, I know her. And uh, Dr., uh, we have Dr. Cynthia Phelps here. And Dr. Phelps is a researcher, teacher, and coach whose work is focused on self-compassion and the inner journey. Through her company, Inner Ally, she works with people to help them improve their resilience, productivity, and innovation by improving their relationships with themselves. So we're very grateful to have her here today. So let's just take a deep breath as we shift into our community prayer. And take a, you can take a moment to fill out your prayer intention cards. And after the community prayer, the ushers will come and take the cards up, and our prayer chaplains will pray over them for 30 days. So the last, co the co last couple of months, I've been focusing on the power of imagination. I have been able to envision and see, I have actually been able to envision and see myself as physically fit, um, as happy in my work, imagining, I can, I can imagine what I love doing for work. It's like, what? what do I want to do? And I've been able to imagine what that feels like. So I've been imagining my future together with my beloved husband. And um, I've been, what's, what's really happened as a result of this is I've actually been getting physically fit. Um, I've been seeing like actual results. You know, I lost like 11 inches in three weeks. So that's just amazing. Um, and it started out with me envisioning what that felt like to be healthy and to feel healthy. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, and I'm going to, this is kind of vulnerable here. I can even imagine myself as a fitness coach at one day. And if you know me, that's like, what? Uh, but I can do that. And my life has become very exciting and very happy. And I've got this great life. And now I have a new little doggy. Um, so I'm going to share a meditation with you that I... Part of it I kind of adopted and modified, but it's about. Um, but what I added in there is about feeling, feeling what it's like. And um, I'm not sure who the author was with this one part, but I adopted. I, I found it on the internet a while back, and I did not write down their name. But as you hold your prayer intention cards in your hands, just close your eyes, if you will, and take a deep breath, and go to your heart space. Just breathing in the breath of life and releasing and releasing. Breathing in and releasing. There is only one power and one presence and that power is flowing in and through and as you right now. So as you relax, bring to the forefront of your minds what your heart's desires are. Having that in the forefront of your mind, let's use our divine imagination and immerse ourselves into the following scene. You're standing barefoot on a soft, luxuriant green grass in a simmering alpine meadow high in the mountains on a distant, distant, exotic planet where it's nice and cool. Waves of rainbow colors undulate through the sky as wildflowers dance and sway, reaching for the heavens in a joyous celebration. A sweet, heavenly aroma fills the air, saturating all of your senses. As you relax into this moment, 
In the distance, you see a majestic grizzly bear casually lumbering along a whispering, meandering stream. The metal larks are darting through the air like cosmic acrobats as a luminescent silver eagle soars high above in a crystalline azure sky. Three glorious suns drench your body with rays of liquid golden love. Can you see it? It's beautiful, isn't it? Every one of us imagine it differently, but we can imagine it. We can feel it. Since our eyes are closed, we see that. We see that with our divine imagination. It's our true self, seeing with our higher senses. And this is a very small taste of who and what you truly are. Our divine imagination knows no bounds. You are the sun, the prism, and the rainbow. You are a soul, eternal, a resplendent spiritual being, perfect and free. So using that same imagination where you just saw that scene, imagine the very best in your life and your loved ones. Envision your heart's desires. Imagine what it feels like, the joy that it feels, the flexibility that it feels to be healthy. See yourself doing healthy things, being that, bringing that feeling to fruition. Feel what it feels like to love and be loved by your beloved. what it feels like to be in that dream job. Feel what it feels like to be living your heart's desires right now. You don't have to do or be anything other than who you are at this very moment. It is yours now. It feels, what does it feel like to be truly happy? You feel that right now. Conceive of all your heart's desires and feel them and ma manifesting. Envision it. Feel the joy of this moment and be that unifying, magnetizing, harmonizing love that you are, that you were created to be. Envision the dream, live the dream, be the dream. And so it is. Amen. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for keeping your divine appointment on this holiday weekend. I'm very excited to be here and tell you a little bit about some of the things that I've been learning for myself. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the spiritual path of inner trust and what that means, how do you walk that path, what is inner trust, and actually what are the components of it that you need to build inner trust. And I have a lot that I'm going to cover, and so I'm going to cut right to the chase and I'm going to give you the punchline. <laughs> are you ready? Okay, so either write it down or picture it in your mind's eye. The four components of inner trust are integrity, reliability, compassion, and forgiveness. There will be a quiz. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, maybe. <laughs> so how did I get interested in inner trust? And like, I... How did I even know it's a thing, right? Uh, I was watching a talk by Dr. Brene Brown. Uh, you may know who she is because she's written a couple of very popular books, um, Daring Greatly and Rising Strong, which I, I believe is actually in our bookstore uh, right over here. 
Uh, but she is actually also a professor at the University of Houston, and her work is focused on understanding people through qualitative research. So that means she really collects data and stories from people, and then she kind of figures out what that means and understands concepts about how people work, how they think, how they behave, uh, and so forth. And so the talk that I ran across online was all about trust and how to develop trust in a relationship. And I love her work, and so I wanted to share a little bit uh, with you today. Because she uh, told this really riveting story of her daughter. And so her daughter is in uh, probably grade school. She didn't really say, but uh, she was coming home, and she seemed a little glum. But when they got in the door, you know, she shut the door behind her, and she basically slid down the door and then turned into like a puddle of crying on the floor. And of course, Brene was very concerned and, you know, went over and helped her up and like, honey, what's wrong? Like, what's ha what happened? What happened? And through her tears, she tells her mom, mom, something really hard happened today at school. And at recess, I told a couple of my friends about it. And by the time we got back into the classroom, everybody knew. And they were pointing, and they were laughing, and in fact, they were making such a fuss that the teacher was telling everyone, be quiet, be quiet. And she said, I'm going to take a marble out of the jar. And so uh, in her classroom, the teacher actually used the metaphor of a jar of marbles to be able to give the class a representation of whether they were behaving or not. And so uh, if the class was being good, they got to put a marble in the jar. And then if the jar got filled up, they got to do something really special, like maybe take a field trip, something like that. And so if they were misbehaving or uh, not treating each other well, she would pull the marble out of the jar. And so, uh, you know, here's Brene. Her daughter is just in tears and beside herself, and, and she says to her mom, I'm never going to trust them again. I'm never going to trust anyone again. Whew, that's tough. And her mom, like any mom, after she got over her kind of mama bear uh, response of like, we're going to find those kids and we're going to get them. <laughs> <laughs> really, what she thought to herself is, how am I going to explain trust to my child in a way that makes sense and that she can understand? And so she used the metaphor of the marble jar. And she said, honey, trust between people is kind of like a marble jar. You can do things that put a marble in somebody's jar that you're friends with. And they can do that for you. Little things that you know that you can trust them. And once your jar is full to a certain point, then you know that you really can trust them with some of the things that are very hard and really important to you. And her daughter got it, you know? She kind of nodded and was like, yeah, yeah, okay. And she said, honey, do you have any marble jar friends? And her daughter said, oh, yes, yes, I definitely have some marble jar friends. My friend Hannah, if there's no place for me to sit in the lunchroom, she will scoot over and give me half a hiney seat. <laughs> and Brene was like, okay, all right. <laughs> and then she said, well, what, is, there any, is there anything, anybody else that's a marble jar friend? And she says, oh, yes, my other friend. You know, she remembered and said hi to my grandparents by name in our soccer game. And this kind of got Brene thinking, like, you know, these are really tiny instances between people. Could it actually be that this metaphor that she came up with on the fly of tiny things adding up to trust, is that really the way it works? And uh, because she's a qualitative researcher, she went back to her research lab and she started interviewing people and collecting stories from people. And indeed, it seems like trust works the same way as the marble jar. 
the things that we do to build trust are not grand gestures. They're not the, oh honey, I planned you a giant vacation, or you know, I bought you a new car. Those are not the things that build trust in a relationship. It's actually just the little everyday things where I got up off the couch to get you something that you wanted. You know, those little tiny moments in life. Uh, and so I was thinking to myself as she was talking that it reminded me a lot about what I do, the work I do with people. I do coaching. And one of the things that people come to me for is they are kind of concerned about some of their own habits. And I thought, oh, well, you know, the marble jar seems like a really great way to explain kind of how you build and how you uh, eliminate habits. It's very tiny things. You make a decision about what you want to do, and you take a tiny action. Uh, and as I was thinking about that, how these tiny decisions lead to habits. I was also thinking about spirituality and how in religion, really, oftentimes, we call that ritual. So a ritual, a religious ritual, is something that is basically a well-implemented habit. Now, I grew up Protestant, and so we didn't really have a whole lot of rituals in the way that I practiced my religion, other than going to church on time. Uh, but I had a Catholic friend who did the rosary um, and also went to confession, and they had some more uh, rituals in their life. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting, this connection between habit and spirituality. And, and then I remembered the first time that I had ever connected habits and spirituality for myself. My parents had just uh, retired and moved from Michigan down to Georgia, and they were attending this new church that they were very excited about. And one of the things the folks of the new church did was a fast every year. Uh, you might be familiar with it. I think it's gotten pretty popular. It's called the Daniel Fast, and it comes out of the book of Daniel when Daniel is trying to uh, deal with King Nebuchadnezzar and really wants to kind of keep himself clean, if you will, because he wants to follow his own spiritual principles. He doesn't want to be sucked in to the king's extravagance, and so he says, no, I won't eat the meat or drink the wine of the king. And so uh, their church practices this ritual by doing a three-week fast every year where they just eat fruits and vegetables. And uh, the first year I was like, oh, that's nice. Good luck with that. <laughs> but then I saw kind of some of the outcomes. You know, it, it wasn't a, a diet. It was a fast. And the purpose of the fast was to become closer spiritually to source. And I saw the outcomes for my parents. And so next year I did it for myself. And I remember uh, something happening, I think it was maybe the third week, and you know, your friends tend to notice when you're doing something like this, because you're like carting around vegetables and you're chewing on carrot sticks and stuff. <laughs> you can't go out to eat it with anybody. <laughs> and um, one of my friends was asking about it, I'm like, oh, I'm doing this fast and whatever, and she heard what I had, you know, no grains, I couldn't do dairy, no meats, and she was like, wow. She's like, you haven't cheated at all? <laughs> And I remember uh, looking at her, and I think I kind of had that look your dog has when it's confused and it looks at you like, Ur. <laughs> because I was so confused by the question. Because in my mind, you know, this wasn't a diet. This was a commitment that I had made myself to myself and to spirit. It, it was something that was very different. And so the, all, the whole idea of cheating you know, yes, I wanted to eat other things, right? But, like, the idea of cheating seemed ridiculous to me because it seemed like cheating God. And that, che that seemed absurd to me. But then I made a note to myself, of like, huh, that's really interesting because this is the first time I have ever modified my diet in any kind of way over a long period of time. For me, three weeks was a long period of time. <laughs> so I thought, huh. Isn't that fascinating? There's this connection between habit and spirituality. And so one of the things that Brene did in her talk, you know, because she's a researcher, she studies this stuff very carefully, and so she broke down what trust was 
into several different components. And as she's talking about these different components of trust, I kept having these flickerings of remembrances of working with clients that had come to me to work on habits. And I remember one woman in particular sitting across the table from me, and she looked at me and she said, I have tried so many times, and each time I have failed to try to stick to a diet. She said, I don't know if I can try again. I don't trust myself. And then I also remember a young man who came to me uh, because he was struggling with alcohol use disorder. He had tried several times to quit on his own. And he came to me and he said, I need help. I don't trust myself to be able to do this alone. And I thought, huh. This is really interesting, this connection. And of course, because I take people on inner journeys and I help people to understand how to have a better relationship with yourself, be more compassionate with yourself, I was fascinated by the idea of inner trust and what inner trust meant. And I knew it was something that was worth my time because when I looked at these people in the face, they looked hopeless. They looked helpless. They basically um, were stuck. They weren't able to move forward. They were kind of paralyzed in their life. Uh, and in fact, I felt like they actually were, they actually had an experience of separation. And so the way that I would describe it in my world is as a separation from the divine. And I believe that is one of the problems that not being able to sustain inner trust causes for us, is that it creates these feelings of helplessness, these feelings of being stuck, but really even more insidious is this separation, this feeling of humanness, of separation from the divine. And so I'm like, aha, this is a problem, and I need to solve it. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I'm going off of Brene's research, and so I looked at the components of trust that she had developed, and I pulled the ones that I thought made sense. If we were to describe trust as inner trust and part of our inner spiritual path, our inner journey. So, uh, back to the four components. Do you remember what they are? <laughs> Integrity. Do I remember what they are? <laughs> Reliability, compassion, and forgiveness. Okay. And so let's talk about integrity. You know, when I think about uh, somebody that has integrity, I think of somebody who is a very good person. You know, like I think the motivational poster says, the person who does the right thing even when no one's looking. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the short way to kind of sum that up is to say that, that integrity is actually living your values. You know, not just talking about your values, but actually living your values. Uh, and so um, Brene gave a really great explanation because uh, integrity is a, is a critical piece of forming trust between two other people as well as within yourself. And she said integrity looks like doing the thing that's courageous over the thing that's comfortable. Or doing the thing that's right over doing the thing that's fun or fast or easy. And so this made a lot of sense to me. And I could picture for myself every time, you know, I made one of those decisions to actually behave based on my inner values that I could drop a marble in the jar, that that marble was contributing to a habit that was going to be something that would sustain me and build a sense of inner trust. Okay. Integrity, reliability, compassion, and forgiveness. So reliability is pretty straightforward, right? 
If you have a friend who's reliable, it's you, if you say you're going to pick me up at the airport, they, they're there on time to pick you up at the airport. They do what they say they're going to do, right? And it's the same thing for ourselves. So when we make a commitment to ourselves that we're going to do something, we follow through on that commitment. That's hard though, right? <laughs> <laughs> the concept of reliability is very easy. The practice of reliability is actually very, very challenging. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of support that concept with a couple of things. Um, you know, one is that you have to have pretty good boundaries with yourself. So you can't just flippantly say, if, say, you have never gone on a diet before, you can't just flippantly say, oh, well, I'm just going to stop eating processed sugar, like, forever. I'm just going to quit it. You know, it's like, you're really setting yourself up to fail. You've made this decision off the cuff. You don't know what you're doing. You haven't done your research. And so you're basically setting yourself up to break your own inner trust. You're setting yourself up to take marble out of the jar, right? And so, Instead, we can actually think more carefully about the promises that we want to make to ourselves. Now, I'm not saying that we don't ever want to make any difficult promises because that really wouldn't be, I would find it hard to believe that we could live in our integrity uh, and only make easy decisions, right? And so, uh, uh, but I do want you to think carefully about what the commitment is you're making for yourself. And then the second part of that is how are you supporting yourself in making that decision for yourself? Like, have you done your research? Have you created a plan? Have you reached out for people? You know, sometimes we want to change things that are pretty simple, like, uh, you know, maybe I want to start a, a morning prayer ritual. And maybe that's not too hard. Maybe the only thing I have to do is set an alarm on my phone to remind myself. There might be other things in our lives that are far more insidious, you know, things that have our well-worn habits in our lives that don't serve us. They're not in our highest integrity and that we want to change. To really change some of these things, we may actually want to get some more serious help. Maybe we want to take a friend on as an accountability partner. Maybe we want to whole attend in a support group. Or maybe we actually want to hire a therapist or some professional to be able to help us with this. But I think it's very important if we're going to make those very big commitments to ourselves that we figure out how we can be reliable, how can we bolster our odds of success so that we don't break our own inner trust. Reliability. Doing what I say I'm going to do when I go to bed early and I say I'm going to get up early to take care of this pile of work, when the alarm goes off, I get out of bed. I honor my commitment to myself and I add a, a marble to that jar of inner trust. Okay. Integrity, reliability, compassion, and forgiveness. So compassion is one of my favorite things to talk about because self-compassion, if you have it, is something that can really improve your life. It can make you more resilient, more productive. It can help you change habits uh, in a healthy way. Um, it actually lowers your stress and, and uh, anxiety and depression. And so it's, it's fabulous. But I think it's also turning that compassion in towards ourselves is also something that we need to do um, to be successful in, in building inner trust. Uh, and so when I'm teaching people how to be self-compassionate, creating a kind and supportive relationship with yourself, um, invariably somebody will say, well, if I'm nice to myself, I'm just going to eat the whole jar of cookies. And I say, I think you might actually be conflating self-indulgence with self-compassion. These are two different concepts. So self-indulgence, and I'm not saying they're good and bad, they're just different, right? Self-indulgence is when you decide you're going to spend that whole paycheck on the vacation. Self-indulgence is when you're going to, you know, buy yourself that trinket that you really, really want right? Something that's an indulgence. Self-compassion, on the other hand, asks this question. 
what is in my highest good? What is in my highest good? And I oftentimes will use an example of a mother who is compassionate, uh, kind of everybody's best mother, uh, idyllic character. <laughs> and so, you know, if a child uh, asks mother for a cookie, uh, a compassionate response may be to give the child a cookie. Um, if the child asks for the whole jar of cookies, it's probably not a compassionate response for the mother to give the whole jar of cookies to the child because the child may not have developed the skills to self-regulate yet, right? So as that compassionate mother, you are the one that's asking the question, what is in the highest good for this child, right? And oftentimes we do this in our relationships with other people automatically. Like it's very clear that we can see what's good for other people. <laughs> but self-compassion means that we have to take the responsibility on ourselves. And we have to be that compassionate mother to ourselves who asks ourselves, what is in my highest good here? And that's very important when we're making promises to ourselves and when we're trying to keep promises to ourselves. And one of the things that uh, I particularly love uh, about being in recovery, I'm in recovery from alcohol use disorder, is that one of the things that we do is we consistently get honest with ourselves. And I think being really compassionate, being self-compassionate means that you have to get honest. You have to know what's going on with you and then you have to ask yourself what's in my highest good. And so, um, and, and I believe there's a spiritual connection to that. In fact, uh, it reminds me of a book study I did with one of my dear friends, Ellen Tisdale. We looked at the book, Women, Food, and God, where it looked at the spiritual connection to eating. And one of the things that the author did that I thought was very helpful is she helps people to recognize, what kind of eater are you? Are you a restrictor, where you try to really restrict yourself from uh, enjoyment, pleasure from eating, or are you an indulger? Where, you know, it's easy to see how indulgers get off track, right? It's a little harder to see how restrictors get off track because what they restrict, restrict, and then they... <laughs> but part of solving that habit of eating in a way that doesn't serve you is recognizing, getting honest with yourself, and that is a very compassionate process. Getting honest with where you are now and getting honest asking the question, what is in my highest good? Because when I make the tiny decisions about what's in my highest good, tiny actions, I add another marble. All right, you with me? All right. Integrity, reliability, compassion, and forgiveness. And so forgiveness is incredibly important because we all live in our humanness. And this is a spiritual path that we're on. The spiritual path is not straight for me. I don't know about you. <laughs> and so sometimes I know I will make decisions that are not in my highest good and that I will break trust with myself. And when this happens, I need to be able to forgive myself. I need to have a process to just stop, <sighs> take a deep breath, and forgive myself so I can go on. Because we don't want to experience for too long what it's like, that break of trust, remember? Helplessness, being stuck, being separated from the divine. So we have permission to forgive ourselves. Integrity, reliability, compassion, and forgiveness are some of the things that I see as really helpful for us to understand our own inner trust and to be able to build it in a way uh, effectively that we really understand where we're going. We're on the path. We see the path. We're adding little marbles like little bricks on our spiritual path. So, um, 
I'm actually uh, pretty interested in getting some feedback about this because um, I would like to know if what your personal experience with inner trust feels like and if maybe you think I'm left out a key component to inner trust. I'd love to hear about it. Um, and my contact information on the way out if you are interested in, in talking to me. But I would love to hear from you because I think this is really important. This is really important to me in my life, in my recovery, in my desire to be on a spiritual path. Inner trust is something that I feel like I now have the words, I have the vocabulary to help myself go the direction that I want to go. Thank you. So we're just going to do a short meditation here so that we're sending you out on the right foot. So if you want to get yourself settled in whatever position you'd like, listen to your body. I like compassionate meditations. Just taking a breath in, deeply breathing in to settle yourself in. Recognizing that you're in a safe and supportive space right now. Pondering the idea of our own inner trust. Gently remembering a time where you broke trust with yourself. Where you might have had those feelings of helplessness or stuckness. Breathing out those feelings, disappointment with yourself and separation from the divine. I want you to come in as your own compassionate mother holding yourself in your mind's eye as a mom would hold a small child, telling yourself, I love you. I forgive you. I understand you are wanting to live by your values. I understand that you want to live in integrity. Reminding ourselves that we get infinite attempts to fill up our marble jar. infinite attempts to work from our highest good. Seeing ourselves now, thinking about how we can be supportive of changes that we want to make. How might we reach out for help? Who is supporting us? And now, if you wish, bringing your hand to your heart, breathing in compassion for yourself because of your humanness and the difficultness that it is to be on the spiritual path. You give yourself love and compassion. You see yourself coming from this power, power base of compassion, being resilient 
and bright and shining your own inner integrity and values well up in you like a light begin to fill your body with a warm energy and glow begins to leave your body and permeate those around you being thankful now that we have these tools in this language to be able to bring ourselves in alignment, building our inner trust, paving the way on our own spiritual path. Open your eyes and go out into a world of possibilities for yourself.